for talking today with Jack Van Stee of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Jack, can you start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, the where and when were you born? Born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In what year? 1925. Okay, uh, and then did you grow up in Grand Rapids? I did. Okay, what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Uh, my dad uh, was a clothing salesman, and my mother uh, was also in uh, retail. Okay. Did he work in a department store or a smaller shop? Or? I uh, worked in a uh, department store. Okay. Right. Yeah. And did he have steady work through the 30s, or was it on and off? He had steady work. Okay. Uh, and did your mother also work regularly or kind of periodically? No, only after the, the uh, kids were born. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, my parents owned a little grocery store uh, when I was in high school. And then she worked at the grocery store. She mm -hmm. ran the grocery store. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, do you remember hearing about Pearl Harbor? Yes. Okay. And how did you learn about that? On uh, radio. Now, before that happened, had you been paying any attention to the news in the world or the war in Europe, that kind of thing? Mm, not really. Okay. So it's kind of a shock all of a sudden we're at war. Right. All right. Uh, now, how did uh, things kind of change in the community or at school, or did you notice any of the effects of war in the next couple of years? Well, we, I was in high school at the time, and of course uh, we realized that once we graduated we would be drafted. Mm -hmm. And were there people going ahead and volunteering ahead of time? And that some. Kind of thing? Some, okay. probably 25% uh, or something like that. Okay. Now, did you notice much of the effects of rationing and that kind of stuff? Did that affect you very much? Uh, it sure did. Um, we had gas rationing uh, during those times uh, where we could get uh, four gallons of gasoline a week and so on. Uh, luckily, uh, I, I did have a car at 16 and uh, uh, I knew a few farmer friends who helped me out. Okay. They had bigger allotments and they could trade stuff? Or? They could uh, give me some stamps mm -hmm. so that I could purchase more than four gallons. And then uh, I applied for a uh, B card. A card was four gallons. B card was eight gallons. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I applied based on the, on the fact that I, t I took some kids to high school with me. And I got a B card. Okay. All right. And that also allowed you to buy, uh, you couldn't buy tires in those days. Mm -hmm. And that it did allow me to get a couple tires. Okay. So essentially because you were carpooling or right. something like that, that's right. economizing. Okay. Uh, now, uh, as the war now was going on, are you paying attention to the news and learning about what's happening, or do you just wait until Uncle Sam calls you? Uh, no, I watched it, uh, you know, fairly close. Uh, and then uh, Uncle Sam did finally call me, and... Uh, Initially, uh, I was uh, put on limited service because of a bad eye, and uh, that delayed it a little bit, but then they finally caught up with me. Okay. Well, when did you get the draft notice? When uh, were you first called? I would say probably um, middle of uh, 1943. Okay. Yeah. So right kind of as you, you turn 18 then? Right. Okay. Right, because I wasn't 18 until September. Okay. Now, did they, do they wait till you turn 18 before they contact you, or do they let you know ahead of time? Well, they that, let me know ahead of time, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, had you finished high school by then? I finished high school, uh, yeah, in uh, May, I think, or okay. June. Okay, so you're, out, so you're out of high school and you're working, and okay, they call <clears> you. So how did the thing with the eye work? Did you get a medical exam and they send you home, or what happened? Yeah, I went to uh, Detroit uh, for a medical exam. <clears throat> and that's where they discovered it. And then they sent me home. But then they called me, I think, about three months later. And, uh, and then I uh, was drafted and, and went into service January of 1944. Okay. And where did you report first? Fort Sheridan, Illinois. Okay. And was that just for processing there? Processing, yeah. Orientation, yeah. Okay. I was there probably three months. Okay. Three, oh, that's not just orient. That sounds like basic training at that well, point. Well, some training. Some training, yeah. Well, what kind of training did they give you there? Well, um, infantry training, some of that, you know. 
And then, of course, we have the shots and the orientation. And then, uh, yeah, it was three months. I call it induction shots and orientation. Okay. Now, did they actually send you someplace else for an official basic training course yes. after that? Okay. Uh, then I went to uh, Camp Carter, Missouri. And that was in April of 1944, mm -hmm. which uh, I considered basic training and assigned to the Signal Corps. Okay. Now, did you get standard basic training first and then Signal Corps training after it, or did you start Signal Corps training right away? Basic first and Signal later, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so how had you spent those three months back in Fort Sheridan? Just standing around, not doing anything, or? Not a whole lot. Okay. So you didn't have any real regular duties beyond no, miscellaneous no, training stuff no. here and there. Okay. I, okay. Came, I came home quite a few weekends there. Okay. Um, so now you're at, you're at Camp Crowder. Um, what, what's the real basic training like? Well, it was uh, um, my 15 mile hikes and uh, we had to, you know, crawl under barbed wire and And being in Signal Corps, I had to learn how to climb telephone poles. All right. And then uh, uh, I was assigned to a switchboard and I uh, learned how to run the switchboard. And it was there that uh, I made Tech 4 because they put me in charge mm -hmm. of a group that ran the switchboard. Okay. So someone doing that job has to have that rank? Was that the idea? Right. All right. Uh, now, how did the drill sergeants treat you? Good. So it wasn't like in the movies where they're all yelling at you all the time? No, no, no. And were the people training you, were these people who had already been serving in the war and were back, or had they just been in the States? Or They were, we called them cadre, <coughs> and uh, they were basically assigned to camp there. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, there was a captain in charge of our unit. In fact, I got in, got along pretty good with that captain. <laughs> okay. And how long did you spend there? Uh, till January of '45. Okay, so that's a fairly long chunk of time then. Yeah, good, uh, good nine months. Okay. Yeah. Now, at that point, were you part of any specific unit, or were you just all training as individuals? Well, I was part of that uh, 3101 uh, Signal Corps unit. Okay. So you're part, you're in an actual signal battalion. So eventually, does that whole battalion move together to go overseas? Uh, yes. Okay. Right. All right. Now, while you're there, uh, you know, after you get through basic training and stuff like that, uh, do you get to go off the base very much? Or mm -hmm. okay. And where would you go, and what would you do? I went to uh, Neosha, uh, Missouri, and Joplin, Missouri. Okay. More yeah. to Joplin than uh, Neosha because it was a bigger bigger city. Okay. And then I uh, became friends with a family from the First Baptist Church of Joplin, Missouri, and uh, uh, this lady uh, would uh, entertain troops on, her, on the weekends. Mm -hmm. She'd go, go on Saturday night and uh, have dinner on Sunday, and she's a fantastic woman. Uh, I got pictures of her. Uh, she had an invalid husband. Mm -hmm. And yet she did all of this for the servicemen. Okay. Uh, and now, so did you attend that church? or was I you, did. Okay. I did. Um, and did that help keep you out of trouble? Partially. Okay. Uh, now, I mean, what else would guy, what else was there to do if you went, if, they, if guys went into Joplin, what would they do? Drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Party. Okay. Uh, now, were there discipline problems with them or guys getting into fights or oh. things like that? Not a lot that I remember. Okay. Yeah. I went to Springfield, uh, Missouri, too, I think, a couple mm -hmm. weekends. And uh, went to a, a Presbyterian church there, I remember, with a, with a buddy of mine uh, who was also from Grand Rapids. And while we were in Camp Crowder, uh, uh, I was uh, dating my wife. Uh, we met in high school. Mm -hmm. And my buddy did the same. We all went to a Christian high school, Grand Rapids Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother came with with my wife, and my buddy's mother came with his wife. Mm -hmm. And they got actually got engaged there. Um, we didn't, but uh, we did later. Right. 
Okay. Now, did you get a chance to go back home before you went overseas, or did you just yeah. sit on it? I did. Um, I would say probably in uh, October of 1945. Okay. Um, yeah. 45 or 44? 44. Yeah. Okay. 44. Yeah. All right. But it's not, so not, not too long before you ship out then, right. I guess. Yeah. Okay. I shipped out uh, January of 45 for India. Okay. Now, how did they get you from Camp Crowder to India? Aboard a ship for 44 days. Well, uh, train first, maybe, before the ship? Missouri? Well, we, well, we took, we, uh, Took a train to um, Riverside, California. Okay. And then from there I got on board ship. Okay. And what kind of ship were you on? A troop ship. I mean, it was a really big transport? Big. Okay. Big, yeah. Huge. A lot of people got sick, seasick, including me. Mm -hmm. And we stopped to Sydney, Australia on the way. And we must have done a lot of zigzagging because uh, it took so long. And we ended up in Calcutta. Okay. How long do you think it took to get to Australia? I mean, three weeks or two weeks or? Oh, oh I would say uh, three weeks. Yeah, that yeah. would be a zigzag. Yeah. Did you travel in a convoy or by yourselves? Uh, you mean as a group? Yeah. I mean, was there a convoy of ships going together? or? Oh, you... oh, no, just by ourselves. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, was the ship a converted passenger ship or just a purpose-built troop ship? I think it was a converted okay. passenger ship. Yeah, because yeah. some of those were fast enough that they could normally yeah. out outrun yeah. submarines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, did you get to get off the ship in Sydney, or did you? We did. Okay. We did. Yeah. Just uh, overnight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember having some good food there. Okay. <laughs> My wife will get that. All right. Uh, so now, uh, when you went to India, do you remember if you went around south of Australia or between Australia and New Guinea, or how did you get there? Or did they ever tell you? I don't really know. Well, you just out in open ocean most of the time, yeah. and could, yeah. Yeah, probably southern and around, because yeah. Japanese were still in Indonesia. So yeah. okay. Uh, and about, do you have a sense of how long it took to get from Sydney to Calcutta? Well, if it took three weeks to get to Sydney. Uh, and we had around 44 days, must have been another, th another th uh, three yeah, weeks. Yeah, something like that. Okay, yeah, so 44 three. days for the whole trip. Yeah. All right. Uh, once you land in Calcutta, now what happens? Well, uh, I was only in Calcutta for a short time, and then they uh, took us by train to Assam Valley, where Lido Road starts. Mm-hmm. And I stayed there, uh, I think, about three months. Let me see if I... Calcutta, and... Um, yeah, I think I was there about three months, and then I got malaria. Okay. And well, I ended up in the hospital. There. All right. Now, what were you doing for those three months there? Uh, maintaining communication on the Lido Road. Okay. Between my... <clears throat> Lido and uh, Mishawaka, Mishino, Mishino, Burma, Mishino. Okay, um, and but you're in India, and those places are. Was Lido in Burma, or is it in India? Lido, Lido was still in India. That's in India. That's one. It's sort of one end of that, the Burma that road. Was the no, that was the beginning of the Lido road. Okay. Now, the Lido road went into into uh, Mishino. Mm -hmm. And then from Mishino into China was a Burma that, road. That's the Burma Road. Okay. We tend to sometimes lump them all together as the whole yeah. thing as the Burma Road. Yeah. Okay. And Mishino is the place that, that's spelled like M Y, like uh, spelled like Miat Kiyina or something like that. Right. But it's pronounced Mishino. Okay. Yeah. I'm just doing that to help the student who will write right. the outline. Yeah. Okay. To know what we're talking about. But okay. Uh, now, so maintaining communications and what, is, what does that involve? Well, it was primarily uh, working on a switchboard. Okay. Yeah, and then people would call in and then ask for a certain number, and then you'd, you'd just, you know, connect them. Okay. Uh, what was your daily routine like at that point? Well, we had ships, you know, that we'd work on, and uh, uh, I was kind of in charge of those ships, of, of the, the people that worked the switchboard, mm -hmm. and then I'd make out a schedule. Okay. And what did you schedule yourself for? 
as little as possible. Okay. <laughs> so did you have what was essentially a day job then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, now, what was the, the, were you on a military base where you were or? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what were the facilities like? What did the place look like? Uh, pretty good. Uh, we had Basher huts that we lived in and uh, they had a decent field hospital there and that's where I ended up with malaria. And um, food, as I recall, was okay. Was it just American military food or did they have local food or? Uh, no, military food. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't have the British coming, giving you mutton or something like Not that? Not at that point. No. Okay. All right. Uh, and now was there, was this also an air base or just a communication station or? Just a communication base, but I think air was close by because um, after spending um, about three months there, I was flown into Kunming, China, okay. over the hump. All right. Uh, what do you remember about that flight? Rough. It was those old C-47s, you know, and I don't think the doors even fit. <laughs> now, could you see outside the plane, or were you just stuck inside, strapped down, waiting for yeah. something? Okay. Very uh, bumpy. Okay. Was it cold once you are up high, or did you yes, not Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. And about how long did the flight take? I don't remember. Uh, it just seemed long. Yeah. Yeah, well, it probably takes a while. They went that fast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kunming, all right. Now, what was that like? Uh, Kunming uh, was a fairly decent uh, sized town, uh, and that was a uh, quartermaster base. And um, in fact, Kunming has become a metropolis now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I stayed there until, um, well, let's see. So the war was over, uh, which was probably the middle of uh, Japanese surrender, basically. Yeah, in, right. In yeah. August. Yeah. yeah, August. So it was, that was August, and then uh, in January '46, I was shipped to Guwahati, India. Guwahati, India. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, what was life like for you in China? Uh, it was. It was okay. Um, except that I had an appendectomy there and ended up in the field hospital. But the, the Burma, that was right on the Burma Road, mm -hmm. and the Burma Road had no guardrails. And the Quartermaster Corps would take uh, trucks and jeeps and ammunition and so on into China, lend lease. Mm -hmm. And they were mostly driven by uh, African Americans who would get hopped up because there was opium mm -hmm. in that region, and they'd go over the side rails, or the mountain sides, mm -hmm. and they'd end up in that field hospital, all banged up. And I was in that field hospital for three weeks for an appendectomy, mm -hmm. so I could, you know, hear them coming in. All right. Uh, now, the, the, did you have a lot of Chinese people working on the base, or were a lot of them around, or was it all Americans? It's all Americans, yeah. Okay. Right. And did you get off the base at all and go anyplace? Oh, yeah. We'd go into town for Chinese food and so on, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we lived in British uh, tents at that point, which were nice tents because they had a nice wooden floor and, and so on. But, um, yeah, that was pretty good duty there. And the, and the climate in China was a lot like it was here, where in India it was monsoon season, you know. Right. And it was always, you know, damp, cold, or damp damp and warm, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so now, um, when you're doing all of this communication, I mean, do you get much information in terms of what's actually happening, or are you just connecting things? Just connecting. Because people are talking to each other on the phone line, so you right. can't, you're not, it's not like you've got telegraph I'm not messages. monitoring it. Yeah. Right. That's just kind of going on. Yeah. Uh, now, did you have a very good sense of how the war was going as you're doing these things? Uh, yeah, I think so. We get morning reports, you know, when and uh, we kept, you know, they kept us informed pretty well. Okay. Uh, did you have any kind of feel for the situation in China itself at that point? Did you have any impressions of the nationalist Chinese government or military or not really? No. Okay. No. I, was, oh. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, too much into culture at that point in my life. Okay. Uh, now, 
you mentioned there, there's opium available. Um, were there other problems or discipline issues that would come up among people who were based up in China or down in India? There were with uh, the quartermaster corps that some of the people, you know, they'd uh, drink too much and have too much uh, opium or, you know, whatever. Now, were you aware of any kind of black market activity going on? No. Okay. No. Because a lot of American supplies kind of disappeared, but a lot of them probably disappeared after we gave them to the Chinese. Uh, but that's other sets of issues. So, I mean, I, cause I don't know what the answer will be. I'm just yeah. filling that kind of thing. But basically, as far as you were concerned, most of these places you're at function just as bases would function in the States? Yeah, right. Uh, you had... Uh you know, you had to try to, to keep up on your social life a bit. I learned how to play, play bridge there in China. I got to, to know a uh, Lieutenant Donaldson who was kind of in charge of the base. And, mm -hmm. and he was another Christian. He knew that I was because of my, uh, he, you know, he monitored my letters right. and stuff. And uh, so, you know, it, it was good duty there. Mm -hmm. And you could keep each other out of trouble at that point. Yeah, right, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that was a... Uh, um, now, did the did you have regular chaplains and things like that there? Were there regular services were on the base? And we did, yeah. But the uh, the main part of chaplaincy I I saw in Camp Crowder with the uh, uh, chaplain DeVries. He came from the CRC Church, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a pretty good group there. Okay. All right. Uh, now uh, at. Kunming, I mean, did you have, were there military aircraft based there? I mean, did you have, or were they based other places? Because you had, I think, the, the 14th Air Force or whatever the descendants of the Flying Tigers were. But were they on other bases? They were on other bases, yeah. I don't, I don't recall an Air Force base there. Okay. So I would say that I, would, I probably was flown into another area and then went by a truck to Kunming. Okay. Uh, now, did you yourself um, go into Burma? I did, but a very short time. Okay. Yeah. How did you wind up going there? Did you have a job to do, or was this just extracurricular? Extracurricular. Okay. Yeah. 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 As a recall. Yeah. So somebody going that way says, hey, you want to come along, or... I think that was what it was, yeah. Okay. Well, you got to see part of the Burma Road, though, in the My process. I did. And that's I did, yeah. That's where you got your impression of right. how it was built. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you had quartermaster personnel there. You had your signals people there. Now, were you just a detachment now of your battalion that was up there? Or did the whole battalion go together? No, it was an attachment. Yeah. Okay. So right. they're just yeah. sending you different places sure. for, for where you need sure. to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, do you remember hearing about the end of the war? I do. Okay. And what kind of response was there? Or? Very joyous. Everybody uh, went out and celebrated. Mm -hmm. And in those days, why we were rationed with uh, a case of beer a month, I think, as I recall. And I think we went out and had a few beers. Mm -hmm. Now, were the Chinese people celebrating too? Uh, well, yeah, there was a Chinese festival that I recall going to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, did you see much of the civilian population generally? Or when you went to town to go eat? Not or? generally, other, other than the only time we would see them when we'd go out for a bite to eat, you know. Um, I don't recall spending much, many weekends in uh, Kunming or so on. But when you were in the restaurants and things like that, I mean, how did people treat you? As I recall, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now your last assignment then was back down in India? Yeah. We uh, were sent to uh, Gahadi, India. And uh, that was, uh, as I recall, in January of 1946. Mm -hmm. We were just waiting our turn then, you know, and uh, being uh, single, uh, with no children, uh, you know, I had a kind of on the end of the list. The married guys went home first mm -hmm. and so on. <clears throat> uh, and, and that was good duty there too. Uh, we, uh, we also maintained communication there. We had a switchboard to, to take care of. And there was one 
from the Brits right next door to us. Mm -hmm. And Ahadi was more British than any of the other places I, I was at. Okay. So in, in what got, ways? We got better food there. Uh, there was a, another little British colony just north of us uh, called Shalong, as I recall it. Mm -hmm. You could get, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and so on there. And so we got fed pretty good there. But we were, you know, other than run, running that switchboard, I was about the only one at that point that ran that switchboard. And um, so in the mornings, you know, we'd get up early and, and the, the cooks would make us scrambled eggs and bacon. And we, we, we ate very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, I had a lot of a lot of extra time, and we were right on the Bama Putra River. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you recall or not, but uh, Studebaker made these weasels. They were an ambitious, uh, 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 ambivious? ambivious vehicle. Okay. And I, I would take that once in a while on occasion. You had to sign up for it and, and go into the Brahma Putra River. That was kind of so fun. You were swimming in your, your amphicar out there. Yeah, I got a picture of it. And drive, driving around out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then uh, I usually volunteered to uh, get the water truck, get, uh, fill the water truck there and uh, so that we'd have uh, water to uh, take a shower with and so on, you know. Now, did you fill the fill that from the river or did you get better water somewhere better, else? Better water. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, right. That could yeah. be kind of interesting. Now, so how much contact did you have with, with British personnel? Uh, some th uh, with that switchboard. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, they show us movies, you know, quite a, quite a few times at night, and then some of them would come mm -hmm. to watch the movies. Now, did they have Indian troops there too? Were they all English or Anglo? Anglo, yeah, yeah, they were Anglo. I, uh, I remember our, uh, and the MPs were pretty big there, and uh, there was one real good-looking Anglo gal there that the, the. Uh, guy in charge of the MPs, he took her over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had some experiences there that uh, we'd rather not talk about. That's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So about how long did you spend there then? Till, um, see, I got out in um, June 5 of 46. Okay. I must have spent... Uh, Three months there, at least January, February, March, and then I then I, I boarded. We took the train back to Calcutta and boarded ship there, and that was um, 21 days coming back to uh, San Francisco. Okay, and was that a better voyage than the one coming yeah, out? Yeah, it was. That's that was a the ship was named Gordon McRae. 21 days to Oakland, mm -hmm. and uh, then I spent a little time there, maybe a couple nights, and then it was. Uh, Discharged at Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. Took the train back from Oakland to okay. Camp McCoy. Okay. Uh, and then you kind of come back home from there? We did. Uh, I uh, called my girlfriend, uh, who became my wife, and she met me in Chicago. And we went home together. Okay. Now, once you got back home, what did you wind up doing? Did you go to college or do something I else? I did. I did. I uh, got home in uh, June, and of course, college didn't start till September. <clears throat> so uh, I, I took a part time job at a uh, candy company. And, uh, well, first I applied, I applied for college. I wanted to go to Calvin. And, uh, Calvin wouldn't accept me because I didn't take a college course in high school. Mm -hmm. And they said you could get into Calvin if you go back to high school and take some of these core courses, you know. And you don't, you don't uh, tell a, send a returning GI that. You yeah. Know? So I went to I went to Davenport, and I got a uh, executive accounting degree there. Went there two years, mm -hmm. and then I went to work. Okay. Um, I um, first I worked part time for a company downtown, a furniture company, and which later transferred me to the plant for cost accounting and inventory control and things of that nature. 
Well, then that company went on, uh, went on hard times, so then I applied to Steelcase and uh, retired from there. All right. Did very well. Okay. Now, you think back about the time you spent in the service, and especially overseas. Are there any particular incidents or things that kind of stand out in your memory that you haven't brought in here yet? Well, there's one thing that, uh, you know, uh, people ask me, were you ever in combat? And um, one night I uh, thought I was in combat because I heard some shooting going on. And uh, we had a one of those English tents with probably four guys in it. We were all laying on the floor. We didn't know what was going on. And it turned out that... Um, the uh, quartermaster people would take the native ladies up in the rice out in the rice paddies, and the locals opened up fire on them. Oh! <laughs> so some of them are getting into trouble. <laughs> that was one thing that I remember in China. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, things were pretty normal. Okay. Now, what do you think you learned from the experience, or what did you take out of it? Uh, maturity, uh, responsibility, um, commitment. Now, those then things that, that stuck with you and helped you as you went forward from there? Yeah. Right. Okay. One thing that people who were in that part of the world in the war often talk about was kind of seeing kind of a the poverty level in those places. Did that register with you? Oh yeah, <clears throat> especially in Calcutta. You know, life didn't mean a whole lot, you know. Um, and even in, uh, even in China, I recall going to a, a fair one day and one of the Chinese uh, soldiers got caught stealing and they shot him right in the... Mm -hmm. You know, right, right on the site. And uh, so, you know, I did realize life in some of those Asian countries didn't, didn't mean a whole lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, there was a lot of poverty, uh, primarily in India, though, where I saw it. And that was in Calcutta where, you know, they laid in the gutters. and um, Really sad. All right. Um. It makes for a good story, so thank you very much for taking the time to share it today. You're welcome.